Hi everyone, this is our next video in our sound unit. So I would like you to have two things ready. Your science book open to page 226 and a highlighter. Okay, we are going to go to our teaching PowerPoint and do a brief review of what we have covered so far. Reminding ourselves, that every sound starts because something moved. And the rapid back and forth movements are known as vibrations. The basic definition of sound is a vibration that can be heard. A wave is a disturbance that moves energy from place to place. And we talked about the fact that a slinky is a great way to demonstrate a sound wave. And we talked about the fact that a sound wave is a mechanical wave. It must have matter and particles to move through. We talked about the parts of a wave. We talked about the compression, where the particles are pushed close together, and then the rarefaction, where the particles are further apart. These were our notes from our first video. So I'm gonna just buzz past those. Then we learned about a wavelength, the distance between one compression and the next, which is demonstrated in this picture. We also learned about the oscilloscope, a machine that measures sound and turns it into electronic, measures waves, turns it into an electronic signal that you can see. We learned about frequency, the number of waves that pass a point in a second measured in hertz, often abbreviated as HZ. And we see a high frequency wave, many waves pass in a second, a low frequency wave, fewer waves pass in a second. We talked about speed of sound in the air, and we said it was approximate because it does depend on weather conditions. It is approximately 335 meters which is 1,100 feet per second. We also learned that sound travels at different speeds through solids, liquids, and gases. And we talked about why, and we reviewed what solids, liquids, and gases look like on a molecular level. So solids have their molecules densely packed together, and they vibrate ever so slightly. So sound travels fastest through solids because it's, remember, sound needs particles and these particles are jammed together. So the sound can move through very quickly. For liquids, the sound travels more quickly than it does through air, but slower than through solids. You can see that the particles and liquids are still pretty close together. There's some spaces. So sound travels quickly through liquids. Sound travels slowest through the air and other gases because there's so much space between the particles. These were our notes from our second video. And then we talked about a couple questions. Sound, a vibration that can be heard. A wavelength, the difference, the length between one compression and the next. And then through which type of matter can sound travel faster Hopefully at this point you know sound travels faster through solids because the particles are densely packed together. Then we talked about pitch. We talked about how high or how low a sound is. And we talked about the fact that pitch is related to frequency. And we had a little discussion about the range of hearing of humans and then of other animals. And we saw some really interesting things like the porpoise has a huge range of hearing. And we're gonna talk about that more in this chapter. We talked about dogs and cats having a much wider range of hearing than we do. And we talked about the dog whistle. You blow the dog whistle, it's too high of a sound for us to hear, but the dog hears it just fine. Now, that brings us to today's lesson. Look at page 226. The first term we're going to talk about is volume, and this is a pretty easy term to understand because it's something that we use all the time. You might say, turn the volume down because the TV or the radio is too loud. All right, following along with me, page 226. 
Volume. Volume is how loud or soft a sound is, and you know you should uh, highlight that as an important definition. The volume of a sound changes as the amount of energy used to make the sound wave changes. A greater energy or intensity will produce larger vibrations. Larger vibrations make louder sounds than smaller vibrations do. You're also going to highlight the sentence that has intensity. You see that intensity is italicized. Remember, bold and italicized words are always going to be important in your textbook. So you're going to highlight a greater energy or intensity will produce larger vibrations. And on the page, it shows you a loud sound and a soft sound. And I also have a picture of that here. So a soft sound has smaller vibrations. A loud sound has larger vibrations as demonstrated in this picture. Next paragraph. There are times that you may try to walk quietly through a room. You carefully place each foot softly on the floor. Your slow, gentle steps cause small vibrations. Very little sound is heard. Compare this sound with the sound made when you run and jump in a basketball game. Running and jumping cause greater vibrations and louder sounds. And I've seen many of you boys and some girls out there playing basketball. You're making very loud vibrations and very loud sounds. The intensity of a sound is measured in decibels. Please highlight that. The intensity of a sound is measured in decibels. The sound of your breathing is about 10 decibels. Talking in a normal voice to your friend is about 60 decibels. The sound of a jet taking off is about 160 decibels. So you have a decibel chart in orange in your book. I'm going to show you two other decibel charts as well. Just to give you a little bit of an idea. So the threshold of hearing is zero decibels. And that refers to complete silence. And 10 decibels is when you're breathing. If you're laying in bed at night, it's really, really quiet. You might be able to hear yourself breathing. That's 10 decibels. Leaves rustling around 10 to 20 decibels. A quiet house at night is 30 decibels because there's always a little bit of sound, even when the house is quiet. Quiet library is 40. The average house, 50. Normal conversation, my voice talking, 60. Alarm clock, 70. The phone ringing, 80. Heavy traffic, 90. An electric drill, 100. Car horn, 110. Emergency siren, 120 decibels. So this is where we get to where it says the threshold of discomfort. When sounds get to about 120 decibels, it starts to feel really uncomfortable on your ears. And then when the sound gets up to 130 decibels, pneumatic drill or a jackhammer, then we have the threshold of pain. This is when you actually start getting pain in your ears. Fireworks at 140, artillery, gunfire at 150, jet aircraft over here about 140. Our book says 160, it's approximate. There's a vacuum cleaner at 70, that's an annoying noise. Chainsaw, 110 decibels. So the reason why people wear headphones, they're like noise canceling headphones at some jobs, is because they're exposed to sounds all day that could damage their hearing. So you will see, uh, example, if you see construction workers outside many times, they will have noise canceling headphones on because they're using very loud equipment. Uh, air traffic controllers. They're all going to have those noise-canceling headphones, the people that are guiding the airplanes on and off of the runway because the sound is incredibly loud. So many jobs would require you to wear those noise-canceling headphones just to protect your hearing, especially when you get up into these higher ranges. And you can see here on this chart where it has colors. So the green are, you know, the green are the quietest. And then as the color gets brighter, the sound starts getting more and more intense. And you see where this says sound pressure. So as the sound waves get bigger and larger and louder, 
the amount of pressure they put on your eardrum as your eardrum vibrate, vibrates gets harder and harder to handle. So that is decibels. Now I'm going to show you a short video and this video is going to talk about how you hear sounds and then you'll be able to see why really loud sounds could really do damage to your ears. Have you ever wondered how sounds make their way from the source all the way to your brain? Take a trumpet, for instance. When it's played, it makes sound waves in the air. The outer ear catches the waves, which then travel through a narrow passageway called the ear canal. The sound waves reach the eardrum, which is a membrane roughly half the size of a dime. They make the eardrum vibrate, which in turn vibrates three tiny bones called the malleus, incus, and stapes. These bones amplify or increase the sound vibrations and send them to the cochlea. The cochlea is shaped like a snail and is the size of a garden pea. It is filled with fluid, and the sound vibrations make this fluid ripple, which creates waves. Hair-like structures called stereocilia sit on top of hair cells and are grouped together as hair cell bundles inside the cochlea. The hair cells inside the cochlea ride these waves, and the hair bundles are moved. The hair bundle on top of the hair cell turns these movements into electrical signals. As the hair bundles are moved, ions rush into the top of the hair cells, causing the release of chemicals at the bottom of the hair cells. The chemicals bind to the auditory nerve cells and create an electrical signal, which travels along the auditory nerve to the brain. Different hair cells respond to different frequencies of sound. The hair cells at the base of the cochlea detect higher pitched sounds, such as a piccolo or flute. The hair cells toward the top of the spiral detect progressively lower pitched sounds, such as a trumpet or trombone. At the very top or apex of the spiral, the hair cells detect the lowest pitched sounds, such as a tuba. The auditory nerve carries the electrical signal to the brain, which interprets the messages as sounds that we recognize and understand. Okay, so that video shows you how you hear. And you see how the sound waves hit the eardrum and the eardrum vibrates. So if the sound waves are very, very large and they have a lot of pressure behind them, that can cause a threshold of discomfort, can cause pain, it can also damage those little hairs, those little cilia in your cochlea, and so you lose some of your hearing. So you have to guard your hearing and protect it. Do not listen to things that are too loud. Be careful and protect your ears. And also, just another note, as I was watching that video, God's creation is so incredibly amazing and complex. Even just your ear, there's so many different parts of it that all work together beautifully. I think looking at the design of our different organs and our ear help us to appreciate God as the creator and help us to believe that we really were created. It's, it's such an incredibly complex and beautiful thing, our hearing. All right, we're at the top now of page 227. Follow along, please. <clears throat> the human ear can be damaged by too many large, loud vibrations. Because sound sounds cause your eardrum to vibrate, the force of strong vibrations can cause pain. Exposing your ears to intense sounds for long periods of time may reduce the ability of delicate structures in the inner ear to sense sound. A sudden, this may cause hearing loss. A sudden sound, such as a firecracker going off, can cause temporary hearing loss. You should wear hearing protection any time your ears are exposed to very loud sounds. Okay, the next thing we're going to talk about is, first of all, you have to learn the pronunciation of this word because it doesn't sound like it looks like. This word is actually pronounced timbre. Timbre. Timbre is the quality of a sound that distinguishes it from other sounds of the same pitch and volume. So, 
when, if you're in band, orchestra, if everybody's playing the same song and the same notes, you know that it doesn't sound the same. When the flute plays the song and when the clarinet plays the song, it sounds different. Timbre is the quality of the sound that distinguishes it from other sounds that are playing the same thing. So it shows you here the different, uh, just how the different waves look. It's the same song but the quality of the sound is very different depending on what the instrument is. So you're looking at where it says quality on page 227, first column, and you're gonna highlight the first sentence. It says, timbre is the quality of a sound that distinguishes it from other sounds of the same pitch and volume. Before a band concert, the instruments tune to the same pitch. However, the trumpets sound different from the clarinets and the clarinet sound different from the flutes. They all play the same pitch, but the timbre of each instrument is unique. Most of the sounds that we hear are a blend of several waves. Each of these waves has different characteristics. As, <clears throat> excuse me, as these waves blend, the sound has a certain timbre. If one sound wave is added or removed, the timbre will change. A clarinet has a reed that vibrates. The reed is not the only part of the instrument that vibrates, though. When a musician blows into the clarinet, the long tube that forms the instrument vibrates as well. The air inside the clarinet also vibrates. A skilled musician must control all these vibrations so that they blend to produce a pleasant sound. An oscilloscope image of a single pure sound, such as that made by a tuning fork, looks smooth. <coughs> Excuse me, you can see that? See the smooth oscilloscope reading of the tuning fork at the top. Musical instruments, however, do not have a pure sound. Instead, musical instruments produce sounds that are a blend of different vibrations or sounds. On an oscilloscope, these blended sound waves look rough or wiggly. I have this picture to show you that. There's the flute sound wave. You see how wiggly the violin is, the human voice clarinet. Last paragraph on page 227. You recognize many sounds without thinking about it. You may be playing in the backyard with a group of friends when someone's mother calls from the house. You know immediately whether it is your mother or not. The timbre of her voice helps you to know. Now we're going to view a video about timbre. It's 1963, and one of the highest rated TV shows, The Andy Griffith Show, features an episode where a bluegrass band plays a tune called Dueling Banjos. This now famous tune is often played with just a banjo and a guitar, since that's the way it was heard in the 1972 film Deliverance. Let's hear part of the opening of that tune. <clears throat> Did you hear that? A banjo played a short melodic idea, then a guitar repeated it back, note for note. But why did the banjo sound so different from the guitar? After all, aren't they both string instruments playing identical notes at relatively the same volume? The reason their sounds are different is due to something we call tone color, or timbre. Part of getting the most out of listening to music involves being able to hear subtle differences in timbre, as well as being able to correctly identify voices and instruments by their tone color. Please note that tone color and timbre mean the same thing, and that timbre is pronounced timbre. It is interesting that we use the word tone color when describing the unique quality of an instrument or voice. <coughs> Because if you think of the different instruments of the orchestra as having unique colors, it helps you understand the art of orchestration. If each instrument has a unique color, then one can achieve even more colors by blending and mixing them, just like a painter does. You can also highlight some colors by putting them next to a contrasting color. So if a composer wants a trumpet part to really stand out, he or she may have the strings play the harmony while the trumpet plays, instead of doing the same using other brass instruments. 
In music, composers and arrangers often take great care when assigning certain instruments to different melodic, rhythmic, and harmonic parts. As a final illustration of tone color, I will use a piece of music I composed for a student film where I wrote parts for the violin, trumpet, and trombone. I couldn't decide if I wanted a violin or a trumpet to play the melody in the opening, so I recorded both. Here's the violin performing the melody. And here's the trumpet version. Notice how each instrument was playing the same passage, but their tone colors were different. I have taken the liberty to mix these two recordings together to illustrate how mixing these two tone colors produces its own unique timbre. Tone color plays a very important role when the music is trying to evoke specific ideas or events or used to accompany a play, a film, or a video game. If you're feeling especially tense during a scene in a horror film, chances are the film composer chose very appropriate tone colors to create such a mood. This explains why orchestras are still used today in such roles. The orchestra has been and continues to be a favorite medium for composers to express their musical ideas. Part of that reason is that the orchestra is capable of producing an almost unlimited range of tone colors, and it does it with the highest fidelity. As you listen to complex works such as symphonies and operas, pay special attention to how masterful composers utilize the many different tone colors of voices and instruments to paint us interesting pictures. Be sure to like and subscribe for more music-related videos, and as always, thanks for watching. Okay, <clears throat> I like that video because it's a very clear description of timbre and how he mixed the sounds and created a whole new timbre. I also liked how he talked about orchestration and how movies and video games use the sounds of an orchestra in the background. He used an example of a scary movie. And you know, if you ever watched a scary movie, that music playing in the background makes it scarier. It makes, it, makes you feel tense, makes you feel nervous. You don't know what's going to happen next. If it's a love story or a movie about love, you're going to hear like soft, sweet sounds. So the orchestra is used all the time in movies and video games. So the next time you're playing a game or you're watching a movie, listen like really pay attention to that sound you're hearing in the background. Some of you know I really like Star Wars. So Star Wars uses the orchestra and band music all the time in all of their scenes. And it creates the mood every time. So the next time you're playing a game or watching a movie, listen for the timbre. Okay, uh, uh, your assignment. You're going to complete activity manual page 152. It covers the information on pages 224 through 227. You can use your book, your textbook, and you can use the videos I made for that. Uh, you're going to put the answers into the LMS quiz today. So you can either write the answers in the book first, or you can just go right to the quiz and take the quiz, and it's the same thing as the book page. Okay, that is all for today, and I'll see you next time for more about sound.